I am pleased and honored to be at the, in the moderate, moderator's position for these three fine scientists. And our first uh, speaker is Helen Rowe, who went to Cambridge. You know, every time I get close to somebody that went to Cambridge, I have to say that it gives me chills. And not only that, she's a good-looking lady from Ireland. And uh, she's going to talk a little bit about her area of, of interest in regards to uh, climate science. And I'll let her, uh, let her uh, enchant you with her presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to be talking to you about um, the climate records that we can extract from, from peatlands, providing some longer-term context to interpreting the, the patterns that have been observed uh, over the last century. I'm primarily, in the short time I have available, going to be talking about the methodologies that we employ to look at climate change uh, from this sedimentary archive. Um, I'm going to be presenting some data um, based uh, upon a record uh, which spans about four and a half thousand years. Uh, and I'm going to be finishing the talk at the end looking at some work that we've doing uh, more recently, looking at climate variability from the Irish record uh, during the last 200 or so years. I should say uh, my co-worker or co-author, Graham Swindles, who's sitting in the, the second row there, is also going to be following on later this morning, uh, looking a little bit more closely at some of the causal mechanisms for some of the patterns of climate variability that we see uh, in, the, in the peatland records. Okay, so why are peatlands useful for climate studies? Well, there are several attributes which make them very favorable. Firstly, because of the unique waterlogged conditions that we find in peatlands and a fairly low oxygen content, um, the plants that live at the surface of the peat bog and other uh, microorganisms preserve very well within the fabric of the peat. So we can analyze samples going back uh, many thousands of years and we can very, be very emphatic about our interpretations down to species level. Secondly, the peatland records are actually in many areas very deep. Uh, peat development can uh, span up to about 15 meters in depth. And these, in many cases, are nearly continuous records. So excellent long records. Uh, and these go back uh, several thousand years, in some instances back to the early Holocene, which would be about seven or 8,000 years uh, before present. So peatlands are obviously very prevalent in the landscape uh, in Ireland. If any of you visited, I'm sure you would have seen some of our many peatlands. Um, this is just a distribution map from the north of Ireland. Uh, there's Belfast there where I work. Um, it's actually only one particular type of peatland, though, that is useful for uh, the paleoclimate work. And these are the so-called raised bogs, or ombotrophic bogs, as they're, they're known in the scientific literature. Uh, these are characterized by a, a very pronounced uh, domed surface. And the exciting thing about these raised bogs from a, a paleoclimate perspective is that the inputs into these bogs are entirely atmospheric. So unlike some bogs, for example, if we look at this lower graphic on the left-hand side here, this is a blanket bog. This would be subject to fluctuations in groundwater, inputs perhaps from, perhaps from springs or streams. But the raised bogs, uh, the organisms growing on the surface of the raised bogs, uh, their ecology and distribution is entirely controlled uh, by atmospheric inputs. So essentially, if we collect a core of sediment through the dome of a raised bog, we are looking at a record of atmospheric changes uh, through time. And just a photograph, it's not terribly clear, unfortunately. This is one of these uh, domed uh, raised bogs that we find in a lowland area in the north of Ireland. So the key question that we have to um, address when we work with climate proxies is what climate variability, variables rather, are the um, proxies recording? It's very, very important to try and thoroughly understand exactly what attributes of climate we're actually looking at in the peatland records. And essentially what we're looking at with our reconstructions are fluctuations in bog moisture or bog moisture deficit. 
And they are the product of two uh, essential controls, the inputs to the bog, which is through precipitation, and obviously the losses of that moisture through a, a combination of evaporation and transpiration uh, through plants. So we have this equation that the bog moisture or the bog moisture deficit is equal to P minus E. And studies uh, which have been undertaken in the oceanic parts of northwest Europe have demonstrated that in these areas particularly, the bog signal is particularly sensitive to summer moisture so, or summer droughtiness. That's what our paleo records are essentially telling us. So it's very, very important to be aware of what the proxy is telling us right at the outset of this work. I'm going to be referring you to some work from a couple of sites that we've looked at in the north of Ireland, uh, a site called Dead Island Bog, which is a lowland uh, raised bog. Uh, and this one's slightly to the north on the Antrim Plateau. If any of you visited Northern Ireland, the Giant's Causeway is just a little uh, to the north there. So that's an upland uh, raised bog, Slevenora. So what proxies are we looking at in, in the peatland context? I've already uh, mentioned plants. And if we go to any peat bog, one of the char characteristic features is that the distribution of the plant is very closely and very um, obviously related to the, the hydrology of the bog. So if we look at some examples of uh, the plant species that we find growing in the bog, we find communities of plants that prefer the wetter habitats, uh, for example, the, the mosses or the sphagnum species, and at the other end of the moisture gradient, we find species like Coluna, which is heather, uh, which prefer, prefer the drier sites. And if we were to take some measurements of the hydrological characteristics of the bog at these sites, we would find that the water table, and you can see the standing water at the surface here, is right at the surface at the wetter sites. If we take a sample here, we'd have to dig down a little way before we hit the water table. So they're showing a close uh, relationship uh, to the hydrology of the bog. And as well as plant remains, we actually find remains of other, many other organisms, particularly this group of organisms, which are single-celled protists, uh, called testate amoebae. And I have to say, testate amoebae, in terms of peat and paleoclimate work, are terribly exciting. There's been a huge amount of work and, and mushrooming, really, in the number of research publications using this group of indicators to infer uh, climate change. And that's because they are excellent indicators of, of, of paleohydrology. And we get different species occurring, as the plants do, in different hydrological settings. So the first step in our research when we uh, conduct this kind of work is that we want to be absolutely sure that the testate amoebae uh, communities are indeed responding to bog hydrology. So the first thing we do in this kind of research is take many samples from different sites of the bog, and as well as measuring hydrological characteristics, we're also influencing, looking at other characteristics that may possibly influence the, the organisms. These are biological communities, of course. They could be influenced by many variables. So we do some standard uh, multivariate statistics to try and establish the, the key environmental controls on the modern living testate amoebae assemblages. And what we're looking at here is a plot which essentially shows uh, different species and the influence of these different variables on these communities of organisms. And from this work, we're able to quantitatively demonstrate that the hydrological variables, particularly water table and moisture content, are the key drivers of the, the community composition. So having, having established that relationship in the modern environment, we can then build a quantitative model. So for example, we're going to be working with um, assemblages of these organisms preserved in cores of peat. So we can use our data from the modern environment and what we have here are different species and what these vertical lines are essentially showing are the tolerance to, to different uh, water table depths in the modern environment. So we get species which occur at the dry end of the spectrum and species at the wet end of the spectrum. So essentially we're building a quantitative model which we can use to apply to our fossil data sets 
to infer where the water table was in periods in the past. In other words, to use it for hydrological reconstruction. The next stage is to, to go out and collect a core of peat, and we collect samples from the dome of the bog using various um, apparatuses like this one. And when, once we've got our core, we collect samples at very closely spaced intervals uh, throughout the depth of the core. We can then take those samples back to the laboratory, uh, process them, and look at the species under the microscope. Now, I appreciate that you won't be able to read any of this. Essentially, we've got a core here. Um, across the top here are the different uh, testate amoebae species, and they're varying. These are abundancy changes uh, with depth in core. And you can just see from eyeballing this that uh, on the left-hand side, some of the wet indicators highlighted in blue, they're showing very pronounced changes down core. And to make the point, some of these changes are also very abrupt. And there are also changes in the dry indicator taxon. So we can see from a very qualitative uh, look-see that there has been a hydrological change from this record. But if we look over to the far right-hand side, we can actually quantify water table position uh, uh, through uh, applying our mo quantitative model. So points where uh, this curve here moves to the right are wetter phases and swings to the left are drier phases as recorded uh, in this sequence. Of course, to make any meaningful interpretations about the periodicity and timing of uh, these changes, we need to establish a chronology. And we do this using standard uh, dating approaches, for example, using radiocarbon dating uh, of the many plant remains that are so well preserved in these sequences. Also, we can actually use this other approach to dating, uh, which is tephrochronology. I never thought I would actually find myself saying that the um, hateful ash, which has disrupted uh, flight plans recently uh, and sprinkled a veneer of slimy dirt over the, the surface of my car, um, is actually very, very useful in this uh, um, paleoclimate work. Because we find in periods in the past, uh, volcanic eruptions, particularly from Iceland, have made it over to Ireland, and that veneer of uh, ash um, has become preserved in the peatland record. So if we look at two uh, peat cores, we can actually process the samples and identify a number of discrete Icelandic tephra layers uh, within the sequence. And this is actually very important for stratigraphy or, and correlation of one record for another. We can be absolutely certain that certain horizons uh, correspond to each other. So very important for looking at the, the regional uh, pattern of, of climate change. How do we know that we are absolutely uh, identifying these tephras with certainty? Well, this is what the tephras look like under the microscope, the sort of uh, sharp uh, shards with irregular edges. And we can do some geochemical work using an electron microprobe, and each tephra eruption has a distinctive uh, chemical signature, so we, so we can be certain about the identifications. So in brown plotted here are some of the, 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 the tephra layers in one of these bogs. We can also use this other technique by looking at spheroidal carbonaceous particles. Now, these are essentially the byproduct of incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. Um, these small ash particles are also preserve in the peatland record, and we can extract and analyze them. And they typically begin in the mid 19th century and they rise in the peak in the Irish records in the early 1980s. So, again, uh, this technique is useful and well established for dating uh, recent sediments. So, we can use the radiocarbon dates, the tephra layers, and the, the ash, uh, the fly ash, to build quite sophisticated age models, which really are important when interpreting uh, proxy data sets. Uh, this is another diagram from the second bog, uh, the upland raised bog, and we, we ha see a similar pattern of water table variability to that of Dead Island, the, the bog I showed you a few minutes ago, but we notice that there are changes in peat accumulation rate. And this is because at upland sites, the peat grows a little more slowly. So we always have to be aware of these things uh, when comparing regional records. So we can start to pull our data sets together, and what we have here 
uh, is a composite plot on the left-hand side, a compiled um, hydrological profile through time. Um, this is uh, plotted in years, uh, calendar years BC and AD. Uh, from the two Irish sites, uh, this profile here is from a third bog in Northern Ireland. Uh, this is from a bog in the south of Ireland. Uh, this is a similar data set uh, from Northern Britain. And we can start to see um, a number of trends emerging. And I've highlighted, it's quite a complicated signal here, but I've highlighted four major episodes of dryness uh, that we see in this record. The first dating from about uh, 1150 to 800 BC. A second swing in the first millennium BC, which Graham is going to be talking about uh, a little bit uh, later on this morning and also looking at some of the causes of that change. A third swing in the 3rd to 5th century AD, and then at the top we see a very clear pattern of, of, of drying in these um, regional bog records. And we can compare our proxy data set with other hydrologically sensitive proxies uh, from Northwest Europe. We have a European lake level uh, data set in, in the banded uh, column here, the black and white bands. And these white bands are periods when European lake level data sets record a, a lowering of lake levels, uh, and these correspond quite nicely to our uh, drier episodes. So having established that this proxy appears to be working very well on this longer time frame, uh, what we're doing uh, currently is using this to look at um, more closely at the patterns of hydrological change from the Irish peatlands during the last 250 years. Uh, and this is the work of a PhD student, uh, and it's ongoing. And essentially, she's looking at a large number of sites. She has nine sites from raised bogs across the north of Ireland. She's selected sites in different topographic and different rainfall um, locations, bogs of different sizes, bogs of different floristic characteristics. Some of the questions that we're looking at here is when did the episode of recent drying begin? Was it regionally synchronous? Um, are the records re replicable from different areas of the region? And of course, another key question is to try and uh, look at comparisons between the bog-inferred hydrological change and instrumental records of climate variability. And we have a record from the north of Ireland that goes back to um, the 1840s. Uh, so we're, we're trying to put this data together to really try and analyze uh, recent warming uh, that, or recent drying that's been recorded. So this is one of her preliminary diagrams. This is a test data MEB diagram. Um, she's got only two dated horizons so far. We're still awaiting further dates back. But this is a very distinct 1947 tephra layer. These are some of her test data MEB assemblages, the wet indicators on the left, and you can see that they're declining towards the top of the sequence after the uh, 1947 event, and the dry indicators, some of these are increasing. And what we've done is we've applied the quantitative model, which uh, Graham Swindles uh, developed for the, for the uh, longer Holocene chronologies, and we see in this record accelerated drying in the latter half um, of um, the 20th century coming towards the present. We see some interesting variability uh, in the, the 50 years before this. This may correspond to the, the last peak of the Little Ice Age in the 1880s. And in fact, from the instrumental data sets, we know that this was cooler in Northern Ireland and also wetter. So it's going to be very interesting. This is very preliminary work to, to really see how this work develops uh, over the next uh, couple of years. So really just to summarize what I've covered, I've looked at the processes that we employ to extract this paleoclimate data right from the uh, early stages of sample collection, the development of the species environment relationships, and the subsequent uh, model construction um, to look at paleohydrological change. I've talked to you about the importance of uh, establishing a good chronology, and I've given you a little flavor of some of the, the types of data that we're getting uh, from this archive. And I've highlighted some periods of climate change uh, from the Irish record. And clearly, um, the next stage in our um, sort of scientific research pathway is to start to look at rates of change, scales of change, periodicities of change, and then to try and make that leap 
to look at uh, forcing mechanisms. And I shall leave it there. Okay.